Democratic Republic of Congo entered the second day of voting today. The election commission, known as CINI, extended voting after chaotic rollout and lengthy delays yesterday meant many could not vote despite standing in line for hours. President Felix Shitsakedi is seeking a second and final five-year term. There are 18 other candidates, but his top challengers are his 2018 electoral rival Martin Fiyulu, businessman Moise Katumbi and Nobel laureate Dennis Mukwege. My Swahili service colleague Abdul Shakur Abud is in Kinshasa, and a short time ago he updated editor Kate pound Dawson on the election. Uh, well, yes, uh, everything looks like it's going on smoothly today, uh, although in Kinshasa you don't have a lot of stations which are doing the voting again, but mostly it's in the east where we are told a lot of people did not participate in the voting. So as far as we understand, it's all going on well and uh, it hopes to be finished today. While that is going on, counting has finished in some places. We visited some places here in Kinshasa, some uh, vote polling stations have finished counting and they've even uh, announced the, some of the winners. But that is really, really very less than a 1%, we can say. I understand there is some controversy about extending the voting, uh, that some opposition party members are unhappy about it. What, what's going on with that? Yes, uh, the opposition are totally angry, not only about the extension of the voting. The re- extension of the voting is illegal according to the Constitution. But five of the candidates, uh, presidential candidates, uh, together with Martin Fayulu, who was beaten by Chisekedi in 2018, together with Moise Katumbi and Mukwege, Dr. Mukwege, and uh, another popular person, uh, Theodore, have issued a statement shortly saying that they want the whole process redone. They consider the elections illegal. They don't feel the elections were free and fair, and they feel there was a lot of irregularities. So they have issued a statement not recognizing the elections before even the results are out. Is there any announcement as to when we might get results has have those been postponed is there any uh definite indication as to when we'll get all the final numbers no we don't know we have no idea Seni themselves they don't know we try to tell them uh, about two hours ago they issued a statement saying uh that they agreed the president of uh, Seni Kadima saying that they agree there has been a lot of problems but uh They think everything is going well, but uh, hoping that by tomorrow they will be having all results counted from all areas where people are participating today and expect in the next 48 hours they might have partial results. Well, that was Abdul Shakur Abud with the VOA Swahili Service, who was speaking with my colleague Kate pound Dawson. In Sudan, where a conflict between two competing military factions has gone for more than eight months, eight, eight groups say more than six million people are on the brink of famine. Over a three-day period, recently more than 300,000 people fled an area in Al Jazeera state that before had seemed relatively safe. Matilda Vu, advocacy director in Sudan for the Norwegian Refugee Council, tells viewers Carol Van Dam that people don't realize how significant those numbers are and that the, she is aware of reports saying some refugees who return to Sudan are being forced to fight by both the Rapid Support Forces and the Sudanese Army. Sudan was already one of the largest displacement crises in the world. We had more than 6.2 million people displaced over this past eight, past eight months. One million of them crossed the borders into the neighboring countries. But now, just in three days, 300,000 people are now forced to flee. And the tragedy of this is that most of them had to do this twice in the past eight months. They had to to do it twice because eight months ago they were living in Khartoum, in the capital city, and they thought they were okay. And on the 15th of April, a sort of urban warfare completely destroyed the city, completely destroyed the capital. And you had basically more than 30% of the inhabitants of, of Khartoum, they've left. And they found refuge 160 kilometers away in Wadmadani. 
many of them couldn't go further away because they just simply had no means to go further. They couldn't pay uh, for transportation. They had nowhere to go. And so they were stuck in Wad Madani. And now in, over these past three days, fighting basically was at the door of the city and then entered it. And that's how we see now continuous flow of families, completely desperate, completely traumatized and tired to have done to have gone through this again and again. The, the NRC is there on the ground um, in a lot of these uh, neighboring um, areas where the refugee camps are set up. Can can you share some like personal stories of some of these families where you've seen these people come across the border? Yes. So, I mean, the, the tragedy of, of Sudan, again, is that um, it's first of all, Sudan was a country of asylum. You know, it was uh, one of the it was hosting one of the largest population of refugees of the continent. Eritrean, Ethiopian, South Sudanese refugees had found refuge in, in Sudan. Starts the war, uh, this basically country of asylum becomes a war zone. And you have basically a mix of foreign nationals and Sudanese people running for their life and basically trying to find a shelter and safety across the border. So they fled, 1.1 million people fled to Chad, South Sudan, Ethiopia and Egypt, mostly. And all those uh, neighboring countries, uh, where most of them will work uh, in, in those countries, and we know that those countries are extremely fragile. We know that those countries have also their own conflict to deal with. They are also uh, struggling with uh, economic downturn, with uh, a lot of humanitarian crisis on their own, and have zero capacity to actually welcome and host properly uh, people who are fleeing the war in Sudan. So, for example, in Chad, you have you have a caseload of, of refugees who have been here for 20 years because uh, 20 years ago they fled the genocide in Darfur. And now they are seeing hundreds of thousands of people coming, crossing from the same border through the same roads that, you know, 20 years ago they fled uh, because, again, uh, Darfur is on fire and mass atrocities are being committed. Uh, it's the same for South Sudan, where South Sudan has seen a lot of conflict over these past years. A lot of refugees from South Sudan crossed into Sudan to find safety, some of them reaching Khartoum. And now those same people have to return back to South Sudan in places that you know they don't feel safe either. So I don't think there's many wars in the world where people are fleeing a war zone to end up in another very unstable and very fragile country. And then we've heard reports on top of all that, with this kind of miserable conditions you're talking about, that the people find in these um, refugee camps, there's not enough food. There's people with weapons inside the refugee camps and there's violence there. So some of them have actually turned back to Sudan and then they get forcibly recruited by both sides, either be it the RSF or the Sudan army. Have you heard anything about that? We've seen those reports and they are extremely, extremely concerning. And, you know, what these reports shows is how complex the situation of Sudan is and how also it's not only about Sudan, it's also about the region. And that if we continue to turn the blind eye on what's going on in Sudan, on the refugee crisis across the borders, then we're going to see this type of dynamics. And the people who are going to suffer the most are going to be the civilians who basically will have nowhere to flee, nowhere safe to be, and will have to, perhaps to resort to very harmful coping mechanism because they have no other choices. That was Matilda Vu, Advocacy Director in Sudan for the Norwegian Refugee Council. She was speaking with viewers Carol Van Dam from Nairobi, Kenya. Guinea-Bissau's President Umalu Sisoko Embaro announced the formation of a new government on Wednesday evening, designating the crucial responsibility of combating corruption to the newly appointed leader. This development unfolds against the backdrop of a nation in crisis, characterized by the dissolution of the assembly and recent clashes that President Embaro has reveled an attempted coup. The relentless fight against corruption must be the backdrop 
No one has the right to take the public good for himself, said Mr. Embaro at the investiture of the new head of government, Rui Date Bolos, on Wednesday. If tomorrow we discover suspicions of corruption against you, you too will be brought to justice. All institutions must be audited, starting with the accounts of the presidency of the republic. No one should be above the law, he added in Guinea-Bissau Portuguese Creole, one of the most widely spoken languages in this former Portuguese colony. Mr. Embalon then appointed a new 33-member government made up of 24 ministers and nine secretaries of state, drawn from his camp and the opposition PAI Terraranka coalition, which remains in the majority in the new government team. These new ministers and the secretaries of state are due to be sworn in on Thursday, according to an official program. The new Prime Minister Louis Date Bodos was head of a transitional government in the early 2000s after serving as finance minister in the late 1990s. He replaces Gelado Jao Martins, who was ousted on Wednesday, eight days after being reappointed as head of government. Both leaders are members of the historic PAIGS party, which heads the PAI Terraranka coalition, which won a majority in the National Assembly with 54 of the 102 seats in the parliamentary elections held in early June. Mr. Martins was reappointed as head of government on 12th December despite the dissolution of the National Assembly by President Embalo following clashes between the National Guard and the Army on 1st December which left at least two people dead in the capital of Bissau. The dissolution of parliament calls for legislative elections to be held at any unspecified date. Guinea-Bissau's head of state described the events of 1st December as an attempted coup d'etat while the president of parliament and longtime opponent of Mr. Embalo denounced a constitutional coup d'etat by the latter.
Life changes just open the door, but one thing's certain, I'll always be your